train, for its type, is the most powerful vehicle on land. And the engines of Sodor are the power behind the docks, industries and branch lines that make up the world-renowned North Western Railway. These are the stories of Sodor. In all honesty, I've never fully understood the concept of choice. This shouldn't come as a surprise, given that engines have always been built to serve a specific purpose, like pulling express trains, goods trains, or both. I wouldn't call this a bad thing, as such purpose gives us the drive to excel in our designated roles. That's not to say we come pre-built with the knowledge, of course. Like everything else, we cultivate our expertise through experience and training. Even I had to be shown how to handle trucks when I first came to Sodor, for I had spent much of my career up to that point as a passenger engine. Thomas and Toby instructed me in such work, often through strenuous means, which I am grateful for, as I became a decent mixed traffic engine as a result, if I do say so myself. When Percy joined our crew, Thomas and Toby took him under their wing. Again, their combined experience helped mold our number six into quite the accomplished shunter, one who took the odd train every now and then, if the rest of us were busy. About six months after he arrived, Mr. Starr decided Thomas should show Percy our operations on the Farquhar branch, which our number one was delighted to do. Okay, Percy, here we go. First off, we got the Elm River. My driver reckons he'll one day just throw a line into the water from my cab. Next up, here's the water mill. If you're into anything green, you'll love this line. I am green, Thomas. Oh, right. This here is Dryor, and that there is its airfield. And here we have the old mill. What does it do? No idea, to be honest. I sometimes think it's just there for show. That there is Maithwaite. In the spring, they deck the whole station out with flowers. That's the Toy Rex Sawmill. The station itself isn't too far off. And there it is. What's down that line, Thomas? The Toy Rex Mines. There are shafts that run beneath the tracks there, so always keep an eye out for the danger signs. This stretch of track will take you past Hackenbeck, which is right there. A short ways up, you'll find a paddock and a tractor who runs it. Hi Terence! Hi Thomas! That's a quaint little cottage. Yeah, that's where Mrs Kindly lives. She lives up to her name, I tell you. You'll meet her soon enough. And here we have Farquhar itself. So, Percy, now that you've seen the branch, what do you think? Oh, it's beautiful, Thomas. I will never get tired of working this line. That's good, because you'll see plenty of it today. Yes, Mr. Star mentioned something about a quarry. Yeah, it's a stone quarry up in the hills. Oh, show me, Thomas. I want to see every part of this line. All right, all right. Settle down. Let's go. At the end of the branch line is the Anofa Quarry, which had always been a great client of ours, as we would take stone away from it and deliver supplies to it. And its engine, Clive, formerly of the Sodor and Mainland Railway, had always been a great friend of ours. I'd like to digress a moment to discuss the S&M's three engines, Neil, Clive and Matthew. As I said on a previous occasion, the trio were privately bought following the closure of their company. Aside from Clive, Neil worked the China clay pits near Brendam, while Matthew was purchased by the Carlton Lumber Yard. Thomas and Percy's presence on the branch wasn't just for orientation, of course. 
It was also to fill a large shipment of stone that needed to go out, as the quarry's manager had told Mr. Starr. Good morning, Clive. Ah, oh, Thomas, you young whippersnapper. There you are. I thought I'd have to take these trucks out to Nefford myself. I was just giving our new shunter a tour of the line. Clive, this is Percy. Percy, this is Clive. Hello there, Clive. My, my. The shunters keep getting younger, or I'm just getting older. You're not old, Clive. You're ancient. <laughs> I can still give you a run for your money, Thomas. Oh, I know you can. All right, enough chit-chat. Time to get to work. I'm sure you notice all those trucks on your way in. That lot, and more, has to go out by day's end. By day's end? Is that possible? Of course it is, Percy. We're the Norises. We can do anything. The way I figure it, I'll organise the trucks while you two alternate taking them down to Ellsbridge. I assume Henry will be there to take them on to Napford? He's already on his way. Tops. Alright, let's get started. Time to put you whippersnappers through your paces. And my word, Clive did exactly that. All day long, Thomas and Percy bustled back and forth between the quarry and Ellsbridge, where Henry picked up the long lines of Marshall trucks for delivery to Napford Harbour. It truly was exhausting work, but together they chipped away at the mighty order until there was only one small line of trucks left to take. Whew! After today I'll sleep for a week. Quick question, couldn't we have saved a lot of time and effort if Henry had just come up to take the trucks directly to Napford? Yes, we could have. The problem is the bridges and tracks along the branch aren't designed to support the weight of larger engines like Henry and Gordon. Hasn't Edward been up this way? He'd be the absolute largest engine that could. James too. Greggy Thomas, didn't you teach us whippersnapper or anything? Plenty. Next I'm going to show him how to deal with Sir Nod Fusspots. Heh <laughs> heh. Don't let this one corrupt you, Percy. You did very well today. Thank you. Yeah, you did good. In fact, I'll take the last lot of trucks down to Ellsbridge. Are you sure? It's my turn. No, no, it's fine. You rest up here a bit, then head on back to Napford. Okay. Thanks, Thomas. See you back at the sheds. And see you later, Clive. Later, Thomas. I'm sorry to say Thomas's next run would be anything but routine. I can't help but wonder what might have happened had Percy set out instead of Thomas. The line between the quarry and Farquhar is a winding stretch of track that snakes its way up into the hills, crossing over the road and river several times. Every engine working this stretch knows to be mindful of pedestrians and cars, as much of this line is unfenced. As Thomas would discover, this was more serious than what we had been led to believe. Afternoon, Constable! Oi! Hold up there! Is something wrong, sir? My oath there is! Where are your cowcatchers? My what, sir? Are you deaf? I said, where are your cowcatchers? I don't have any. I'm a tank engine, not a tram. Don't give me lip, boy! I'm sorry, Constable. What seems to be the problem? The problem is any engine travelling along an unfenced section of track must be fitted with side covers and cow catchers to prevent injury to any animal or person that may stray onto the line. What? Since when? Since the law was passed two years ago. Have you been travelling along this track in that time? Um, well, yes. But I didn't know. Ignorance is no excuse. Your regular law breaking makes this worse. Come on, mate. We've been along this line hundreds of times without a single problem. Blind luck is no justification. The law is the law. I'll be handing you a ticket. Good day. Thomas surely felt ashamed as he set off. No doubt he was also terrified as Mr. Starr was bound to hear of this. I too was anxious about how our director might react as I was late pulling into Napford with the passenger train. Judging by the expression on James's face, he was just waiting to rip into me. All right, James, you clearly have something to say, so let's get it over with. Come now, Edward. I'm not Thomas. I would never revel in the suffering of a colleague. My left piston you wouldn't. I'm just mystified that an engine as reliable as you would ever be late. At least my reason is a valid one. Unlike that time you were slow in taking out that goods train... What was the reason again? Oh, that's right. You had fallen asleep. Hey, I'd had a busy day. I was exhausted. If you can't take abuse, James, don't give it out. Good advice, Edward. But this kind of behavior is unbecoming of two engines parked in a busy station. You're professionals, so try and act like it. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. 
Now, Edward, what is the reason behind you being eight minutes late? A lorry had broken down on the level crossing near Carlton, sir. I see. Just like that, the matter was ended. Though our director was strict, he was also a reasonable man. However, I can't help but wonder if he might have said more had the station master not rushed up to him in a hurry. Sir! Sir! Take a breath, Willie. What's wrong? I just got a call from Ellsbridge. The police need to talk to you about Thomas. The police? What on earth for? Willie rattled off our number one situation, which seemed truly ridiculous to us, especially the part about him allegedly violating some unknown law. What sort of nonsense is that? The law is never nonsense, James, but this does need attending to. Edward, I need you to take me to Ellsbridge right away. Yes, sir. Our director was quick to climb aboard, and I was quick to be off, eager to help my friend. As I sped down the line, I couldn't help but ponder the identity of the constable who issued the fine. Indeed, I had heard of a hard-nosed officer who had just joined the Farquhar force, and couldn't help but wonder if it was the same man. Thomas, are you alright? I've been better, Edward. What happened? They said you broke some law to do with unfenced tracks? So, you've never heard of it either? No, neither have I. Mr. Sir? You, you're here? Would you prefer I wasn't here, Thomas? Um, uh, hold that thought until later. Mr. Starr then went to talk with the constable, who was in the company of his supervisor. The trio spoke for what felt like hours, with Thomas and I languishing every moment. Finally, the supervisor voided the ticket on the grounds of this being a first offence. The issuing officer, who I believe was named Bentley, was none too happy about this. There we are, all sorted. Oh, thank you, sir. And I'm sorry you had to deal with this. Don't apologise, Thomas. I'm the one who's sorry. As director, it is my responsibility to ensure my people are made aware of all relevant laws and statutes. Clearly, I have been lax in this duty, and I will make it right. And our director wasted no time in doing so. First, he had a fence built along the unprotected sections of track leading up to the quarry. Second, he commissioned a number of legal seminars, making their attendance mandatory for us all. These were very dull affairs, as the instructor had all the charisma of a wet carrot. But I won't say these seminars were pointless, as they certainly weren't. We learned a great deal. Much of it was common sense, such as when it came to handling trainloads of hazardous materials, but there were also other, lesser known points, like the requirement an engine must whistle when it passes a signal box during night runs. Although no harm came from Thomas's actions, you can be sure the middies gave him no end of grief. Make sure you shunt those trucks just right, Thomas. You don't want to get pinched again. Push off, Diesel! <laughs> <laughs> so then I said, make sure you shunt those trucks just right, Thomas. You don't want to get pinched again. <laughs> <laughs> Very good, Diesel. Hey, a good telling off. Just what they needed. Yes, well done, Diesel. Way to put them in their place. Well, someone has to. It's times like these, I'm glad I'm on the right side. Good afternoon, engines. Afternoon, sir. Hello, Mr. Zorro. Who's this gentleman? This here is Mr. Hunt from head office. He's been sent to orientate us on the legal points of our operations here on Sodor. Is this because of the Nor'easters, sir? Why should we be made to suffer? We are made to suffer diesel because of the Duchess incident. Or have you forgotten it was your actions that got us fined? No, sir. Good! Then give Mr. Hunt your undivided attention. Thank you, Mr. Zorro. I'd like to start with the regulations regarding the storage and handling of hazardous materials which states quite clearly in Articles 1 through 5. This sounds interesting. Do you know what a simpleton is, Colin? No, what is it? If you ever get the chance, look in a mirror and you'll find out. Okay. On the western side of Sodor, the main line terminates at the seaside town of Arlesborough, linking up with the narrow gauge Mid-Sodor Railway. At this time, five little engines called this line home. Duke, Stuart, Falcon, Andreas, and Atlas. A point worth mentioning, I feel, is that when the Railways Act was passed, its unification statutes only applied to standard gauge railways, meaning that companies like the Mid-Sodor and Scarlowe Railways remained privatised. 
We always did well in our partnership with the MSR as its lines connected us to many towns and businesses throughout Sodor's rugged west, giving us access to work that would have been impossible for a standard gauge line to perform. My driver's been raving about this Amelia Earhart character for nearly a week now. <laughs> Mine too. Can't say I blame him. The first woman to fly across the Atlantic? That takes guts in my book. I wonder what it would be like to fly. I imagine it would be just like rail travel, with its usual ups and downs. No, pun intended. But then, not everything is rosy for aviators. Let's not forget Charles Lindbergh. Ah, <sighs> I know. How awful was that? Having your infant son kidnapped would have been bad enough. But to find his body? What kind of monster could do that to a child? You said it yourself, Edward. A monster. Okay, Edward. We're all done. That's your load, Duke. I still need stewards. He's late. He should have been here 20 minutes ago. Well, I can't afford to wait. There's a ship at Napard waiting to take this lot, and I need to leave right now. And I'll make sure to have a few words with the impertinent scallywag when he arrives. <laughs> Try not to be too hard on him, old boy. No promises, Edward. Of course, had I known Stuart was but a stone's throw away, I would have stayed. I'm told he whistled, but I never heard him. By the time he reached Arsborough, I was long gone. What time do you call this, youngster? I know, Grandpuff, I know. I'm late. What's your excuse? No excuse. I simply dawdled. How refreshing. I'll have a word with the manager and see if he can get a hold of Mr. Starr. My run to Knapford would be both uneventful and wet. All day long, dirty black clouds had been gathering in the skies above. Not long after passing through Tidmouth, the rain came bucketing down. When I reached the harbour, I was thoroughly drenched and very surprised to see Mr. Starr out in this wretched weather. Mr. Starr? What are you doing out here? I just got a call from the MSR. Stuart arrived not long after you left. I need you to rush back to Arlesborough and pick up his goods. I can't, sir. I have to take a colliery train in ten minutes. Oh, that's right. Bother! What's the matter, sir? The ship's not likely to leave in this weather. On the contrary, the captain wants to leave before the storm gets any worse. You're joking, right, sir? You know these seafarers, Edward. The only time they won't set sail would be during Armageddon. <sighs> There has to be someone. Percy! Percy! Stop whatever you're doing! I need you to head on up to Arlesborough on the double! Me, sir? Your name is Percy, isn't it? Yes, sir. Then I must be talking to you. There'll be a train at the transfer yard. All you have to do is pick it up and bring it here. Can you do it? Ye yes sir Good! Then get moving! Ye yes sir Percy pressed bravely through the storm, fighting the wind and torrential rain. Unfortunately, his efforts would be somewhat in vain. He had no way of knowing that, in the time since I had left Arlesborough, Adam had arrived. The middies number three sweet-talked Stuart into letting him take his goods. I'm sure he intended to deliver them to Brendam, and if he did, that would have been stealing, as we Nor'easters had been contracted for the job. I'm sure Percy would have just ignored Adam as their paths crossed, but the arrogant middy just couldn't keep his mouth shut. Don't worry about Stuart's train, Percy. I got you covered. You've got me. Hey, that's my train. Give it back. Find his keepers. Ha <laughs> ha. That slimy thief. Who's a thief? That engine. He's nicked off with one of my trains in violation of Article 219 of the Fair Transport Act. Well, he won't get far. The constable raced to the station master's office, telephoning Marston Heights with orders that Adam be waved down before he could pass through. I'm glad to say that he was, thwarting his attempted theft. Hey, what's this? Is the line flooded? No, Adam. We've received word that you have stolen this train, which is legally the property of the LNER. Stolen? Rubbish! I was merely doing them a favour. Well, until the police get this sorted, you're not going anywhere. Adam was forced to return to Tidmouth, where he, Percy, and their crews had a little chat with the police. I'm sorry to say that no charges were filed against the Minis number three, as it was just as plausible, to the investigating officers I mean, that he hadn't stolen Percy's train and was simply doing him a favour by picking it up. <laughs> he certainly wasn't going to confess to anything else. Regardless, Percy was able to take the train back to Knapford, travelling as fast as safety permitted. Upon his return, his cargo was quickly lowered on board the ship, which set sail immediately, despite the weather. While no charges were filed against Adam or the LMS, I can only imagine Mr. Zorro had a few words for him. Mr. Starr also had a few for Percy, commending him on his applied legal knowledge, which impressed us all. 
You're probably wondering at this point what became of Bentley. To be fair, we couldn't fault him for issuing the fine, but his behaviour towards us, after his superior avoided it, left a lot to be desired. For the longest time, he lurked about the trackside, like he was just waiting to hit us with some kind of infraction. Unfortunately for him, we never gave him the chance. He ultimately had to resign from the force, following a scandal involving himself and the mayor of Farquhar's wife. With him gone, life on the branch improved dramatically, which we have continued to service diligently to this very day.